Hello, today we are going to be doing a calcium silicate pulpotomy, otherwise known as MTA, on number S. These products have kind of fallen into the Coke and Pepsi scenario where MTA is kind of a catch-all freeze for any dye or tricalcium silicate product. Um, we're going to be using Neoputty, a product by New Smile, uh, for tooth number S. And we're going to kind of go through the IFUs, and it's going to be in coordination with the video and go step-by-step -step through this procedure. So I'm just going to be reading through the New Smile Neoputty instructions for use in the category of pulpotomy and apexogenesis, which is what we're doing on this primary tooth, the primary pulpotomy. Um, our first step is complete cavity preparation under some type of isolation using a high-speed burr. Excavate all carious tooth structure using that burr. I like to use a round date for my occlusal reduction and initial caries removal. Um, in this case we're doing a pulpotomy on S's in Sierra, uh, SSC crown on Tia's and Thomas because it has mesial and distal decay, and a glass ion or sealant on number 30 using GC Equiforte. Um, in multi-rooted teeth, you want to access the pulp chamber and remove the coronal pulp tissue to the level of the orifices, and we'll show that a little later in the video. In single rooted tooth, like if you're doing a pulpotomy on DEF or G or one of the canines, you want to remove the pulp to about the level of the CEJ, the cemento enamel junction, or slightly below. It's going to allow for enough MTA product, diatricalcium silicate product, to be utilized and have sufficient thickness, as well as having some type of a tum dent that's going to cover that MTA product. Um, I would typically also make sure that you avoid a product that has bismuth oxide as its radio opaquer. Um, that would cause your restoration to stain, especially if you're doing an anterior pulpotomy and covering it up with a strip crown or something like that. So we're going to rinse this and take a look at what the pulp looks like. Um, so if you notice, we have all, most of the pulp tissue out, a little bit of decay left on the distal aspect. Um, the mesial and the distal pulp tissues are pretty removed. I'm going to take a smaller slow speed burr and remove some of the distal tissue. I can clearly see the outline on the pulp and the floor. Um, so that's going to be our next step is going in with a smaller slow speed round burr. And you can kind of appreciate that's what we're doing now here. And our next step is once we're done removing um, the excess tissue is controlling bleeding. And we're going to do that with uh, some cotton pellets. So the next step in the instructions for use is control hemorrhage using a solution of your choice. Sterile saline, sodium hypochlorite, 1.25 to 6%, or chlorhexidine. If hemorrhaging is still present at 10 minutes, the diagnosis is irreversible pulpitis and a full pulpectomy with obturation is then need to be performed or other restorative choices. In this video, I'm using a size three cotton pellet that I pack into the tooth uh, to allow for pressure hemostasis. I think this is the most difficult part of an MTA style pulpotomy where we are relying on pressure hemostasis to tell us the vitality of the more apical portions of the pulp. And when we think about former creosol pulpotomies or ferric sulfate pulpotomies, we were actually getting a little bit of hemostasis from the causticness of the former creosol or the ferric sulfate um, as a bleeding agent. So the most important thing with an MTA pulpotomy is getting that apical hemostasis. When we look at medicaments that we can place on pellets that are recommended in the IFU like sterile saline, sodium hypochlorite, or chlorhexidine, we're going to go into each one of those and kind of talk about the validity of that. Uh, sterile saline, if we think about it, it's not really aiding in our hemostasis at all. The reason why I don't tend to use it is the heme that's coming from the pulp is actually going to fill up our cotton pellet. So if we just apply pressure down there, it's almost like we're liquidating those pellets first. Um, sodium hypochlorite, I have used 3% sodium hypochlorite, um, and I would recommend not using just a big bottle of bleach, you know, ordering individual percentages, because um, every time you open that big or bottle of bleach, the efficacy of that sodium hypochlorite goes down and down and down. Um, typically, you would apply a very small amount, kind of similar to former. You would apply the 3% sodium hypochlorite to the pellets, squeeze that pellet out, and then pack it into the tooth. Now, why do people use this? Um, I think you get the additive effect of the pH 
um, of 11 of the sodium hypochlorite, and you're also getting bacterial static properties. Um, the AAPD does recommend that you can use sodium hypochlorite when you're talking about pulp therapy on immature permanent teeth. Um, I haven't really seen any studies on using it prior to any sort of pulpal medicament prior to. Um, there is research that shows that people have done sodium hypochlorite for pulpotomies. I think it's an unnecessary step because a lot of the MTA products have a period where they give off a very basic pH similar to that of sodium hypochlorite. Um, you can use it, I just think it's another medicament and unnecessary to the process. Um, chlorhexidine, chlorhexidine um, has been inspected and using it as an endodontic irrigant. The problem with chlorhexidine is the percentages are different. If you think about Paradex, the percentage is 0.12%. And a lot of the endodontic irrigants that are utilized for chlorhexidine is 2%. And there's really not a lot of literature as far as why we're using that chlorhexidine pellet. Um, if we're just kind of filling up a cotton pellet and applying pressure and, and, and allowing it and thinking it's going to be a disinfectant prior for us putting that MTA, that might not necessarily be true. So we could just be packing these pellets in with chlorhexidine and, and we don't really know the efficacy of it. So it's, I would follow that into an unnecessary step, especially if you're using Paradex, because it's below what even endodontists are using that 2% um, chlorhexidine in, in there as an endodontic area. And I just don't think there's enough research that supports that. So if I had to do anything, I would just start off with regular pellets, and then I would go to pellets soaked in some type of sterile water or... Um, a saline solution and then if I had to add something else I would do pellets that are in 3% sodium hypochlorite and that would be a disinfectant some type of pressure that you could put over the pulp. Um, last on my list and I don't even know if I'd really go for it is some type of chlorhexidine solution I would just make sure you avoid Paradex because I feel like it's kind of pointless as far as why you're using it. So after completing my crowns on A and B, I go to remove my packed cotton pellets. And this is what we would want to see um, after we remove our pellets. So looking at the mesial and distal areas of the pulp chamber, you can see good hemostasis. Um, there's not excessive bleeding. We also were able to calm the bleeding down at approximately where that large decay was. So let's talk about success failure. If I remove these pellets, and I still see a substantial amount of bleeding or heme. I would want to inspect the chamber to see if I left tissue tags or significant pulp tissue um, in either of the canals. I'd also want to make sure I'm not getting accessory gingival bleeding from a deep carious lesion or just irritated gingiva that's leaking into my coronal orifice. If if I have some excessive tissue, I'll tend to go back in and then quickly repack the pellets. Um, probably for a few minutes. But if it's still bleeding pretty significantly, then we really need to think about does this tooth need a pulpectomy or an extraction? Um, and, and I think that goes with why MTA has such a high success rate is looking at ferric sulfate or former creosol, we're really using a, a caustic material that is going to cause the pulp stumps to stop bleeding. Um, so you know, the, the success rate with MTA is I really have to have a very healthy um, apical pulp portion for me to place this MTA prior to. Um, so what we're looking at here, we're going to move forward and place our Neoputty. So New Smile has come out with a Neoputty dispensing guideline that kind of shows increments as far as how much you have to dispense for the procedure that you're doing. Uh, you can see for a primary molar pulpotomy, we're going to do about a grain of rice side. That's usually what I tell the assistants when I'm working with, um, but that can be kind of subjective. I think this is nice to use for an assistant or someone who's just starting out using this product just to kind of give you an idea of how much to dispense to help minimize product waste. Um, then I will typically just pick this product up with an uh, applicator. You can use a DICAL instrument, you can use a amalgam carrier. I will typically just use my pickups. It does require a light touch and then I'll condense it into the preparation just with a cotton pellet. So this is what we'd want to see when we look down into our preparation. The 
uh, MTA or, or calcium silicate product has been condensed. We have enough space for some type of obtundent. Um, I usually try not to fill up the entire orifice of the tooth with the product. It, it kind of makes you overuse it if you're trying to fill up the entire orifice and that just leads to product waste. Um, so if we're going back and following the IFUs, um, use applicator of choice to apply neoputty material on the exposed pulp or the floor of the cavity preparation, maintaining a minimum thickness of 1.5 millimeters. Excessive material may be removed using a cotton pellet, slightly dampened with sterile water or saline. If you can kind of think back to the video of me condensing it, you did see a few little hairs coming off that cotton ball because it was dry. So this is when I might slightly moisten it. I would avoid over moistening your pellet because you're gonna wash out some of that uh, Neoputty product. Neoputty is pretty dimensionally stable, but I still like to place an obtundent over that. I don't want to purely rely on the Neoputty or the cement from my stainless steel crown to fill that space. Uh, in this video, we're going to be using uh, Vitrobon, so an, an RMGI, but you can also use a light curable composite, glass ionomer, RMGI, compomer, looting cement. Um, you can use a flowable composite, RMGI, ZOE. There was a good study that came out and looked at obtundents over MTA. The, the awesome thing about MTA is that it seals so well that you can really kind of put whatever you want over this. So for this tooth, I mixed a double batch of Vitrobon, just double the recommended amount, and then I bring the spatula directly over the uh, chamber, and then I will kind of place it with a football burnisher, just kind of level it and have my assistant light cure it. Um, really, all this is doing is filling up the rest of the chamber um, with a product that's going to allow me to finish my stainless steel crown preparation or whatever preparation you're doing over your MTA placement and allow you to be able to not move around the MTA. Like I said, uh, these newer MTA classes are pretty dimensionally stable, but I personally still think it's nice to have something over that versus purely relying on the looting agent from your crown. Um, so we're going to go in and finish our preparation. Um, as you can see, I'm just kind of doing my circumferential reduction and rounding off my margins for my stainless steel crown. I'm just very minimally um, kind of rounding all of these sharp line angles. And then I, I am prepping the distal portion of number T because number 30 is present, so you kind of need to be careful. Um, I usually stand a little bit more on the distal aspect when I'm prepping against an adult tooth. That just gives me a little bit of wiggle room while I'm prepping against a permanent. Um, what I typically like to do is leave a very slim shelf of distal or mesial tooth structure um, between the permanent tooth and the primary tooth. And then when I go in and drop my burr more subgingively, that removes that excessive portion, kind of like how we would prep a class two. Um, you can kind of see the glass or sealant on number 30. Uh, I will go in and polish that later. Um, I like to allow the glass ionomer to set up initially. So usually I do that pretty early in the case and I allow the GI to set while I'm doing other things. Here I'm trying my crowns on. I'm making sure I have good retention and then I'll take a Raytec and dry the area and make sure it's nice and clean. And then uh, in this video, we're cementing these crowns with a glass ionomer cement like Ketac Sem. Um, I like to, still like to use a pure glass ionomer cement like Fuji One or Ketac Sem for stainless steel crowns, um, or there are RMGI like Fuji Sem too. Um, we're gonna clean the excess cement in this area. I'll use a scrub brush um, when I'm using a pure glass ionomer cement because I don't want to aggressively rinse it right off the gate um, due to the poor dimensional stability of Ketac or glass ionomer cement when it's initially mixed. Um, it's very highly susceptible to water solubility, so I don't like to force uh, water under those crowns at all. So now that it's set up a little bit, then I'll go ahead and rinse my excess material. Um, and again, I, I do go back and finish up that sealant on number 30. So that's our final 
um, what we're looking at here is checking the occlusion on the restoration so now we can appreciate the crowns that were done on A and B in the sealant um, on number 30. So thank you guys for watching this video. Hopefully you found it helpful. Um, again, there's lots of different ways to do these pulpotomies. Um, this is just a step-by-step -step following the IFUs. Uh, and that's my recommendation for whatever product you use. Always make sure you're following the instructions for use, whether it's a composite or a bonding agent or a, um, or a, a pulpal medicament. That's really going to help with your success in the long run of these products and making sure you're using them as they have been instructed by the manufacturer. Uh, thank you very much, and hopefully you found this video helpful.